Tyler is originally from Wichita, Kansas. He is of the Harvard class in 2016, where he graduated uh, Phi Beta Kappa and uh, Magna Cum Laude. Um, but more importantly, in my opinion, it was during that time he co-founded the John Adams Society. Uh, he also uh, he studied classics at Harvard and also uh, received a master's with distinction in classics from Merton College uh, at Oxford. Um, and he is now a third year Harvard Law School student. Um, at Harvard Law, he's an editor of the Harvard Law Review and vice president of education and outreach at the Harvard Federal Society. Uh, and today he will be speaking to us on free speech, the original meaning of the First Amendment, and blasphemy. So please join me in welcoming Tyler Dobbs. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for that kind introduction. I'd also like to thank, of course, Dr. Danilo Petronovic, the AAI director, and all the folks at AAI who made this event possible today. Um, of course, I would also like to thank uh, the John Adams Society, my undergraduate debate society, um, of which I'm a proud alum. Uh, I'm so grateful to them for co-sponsoring this event today. Um, and I'll just note, uh, uh, it is the custom, uh, I, at least in my classes, that uh, even the professors here uh, wear the masks. So uh, I'll just respect that custom and wear the mask today, but I'll try to enunciate clearly so that uh, there are no uh, comprehension problems. Uh, I'd also like to say it's a real pleasure to be back here in Boylston Hall, where I took lots and lots of classics, uh, classes as an undergraduate. So it's really nice to be back on this side of the Science Center Plaza, which divides the yard from the law school. So just to the northwest of Harvard Yard, uh, on the edge of the law school campus, uh, you may have noticed there is um, a white Greek Revival 19th century house. And uh, this house serves as the headquarters of the Harvard Law Review. Uh, now, take your mind back to 1959. It's the height of the Cold War, uh, and a group of about a dozen student editors are just hanging out there at Gannett House, um, as it's called, the headquarters of the Harvard Law Review. And one of these students, very true to law school stereotype, decides to throw out a ridiculous hypothetical. If you were president of the United States, and Khrushchev said, blaspheme, or I will drop a bomb on New York City, what would you do? Now this absurd hypothetical, again in characteristic law school fashion, turned into an all-night debate um, amongst these 12 editors. Now the group was almost unanimous in supporting blasphemy in these circumstances. They said, of course I'll blaspheme to say New York City, but there was one student there, um, one of these dozen students. Uh, his name was Nino, and he was an Italian-American from Queens, and he vigorously argued against blaspheming, <laughs> even when that would be the only way to prevent his hometown of New York City from being bombed into smithereens by the USSR. I would never blaspheme, this student explained, because blasphemy is a sin. Nino, the law student from Queens, would of course go on to become associate justice in his Scalia of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and I begin with this anecdote about Justice Scalia because it brings together the two topics of my talk today. Blasphemy, on the one hand, and the original meaning of the US Constitution, on the other. Now, uh, as a law professor and Supreme Court justice, Scalia was the most vehement and vigorous proponent of originalism. That is to say, the view that when, in interpreting, when interpreting the US Constitution, we should follow its original meaning. And as a law student and a Catholic, Justice Scalia was the greatest opponent of blasphemy, the sin of reviling God. Now, we don't know how Justice Scalia would have put together his strongly felt views on blasphemy with his strongly felt views on the Constitution because, as justice, uh, he never had the opportunity to rule on a blasphemy law. In fact, uh, the Supreme Court has never directly ruled on the validity of a blasphemy law. In asides, uh, avatar dicta is what lawyers call them, 
uh, you sort of make side comments that aren't directly relevant to the disposition of the case. The Supreme Court uh, always used to assume that blasphemy laws were just obviously constitutional. So you have famous 19th century decisions by, say, Chief Justice Marshall uh, and Associate Justice Story. And these decisions would just take for granted that blasphemy, prescriptions on blasphemy were part of American law. And fast forward to 1897, the end of the 19th century, uh, and you have the Supreme Court stating, uh, in a case called Robertson, that the First Amendment does not permit the, blast the publication of blasphemous articles. But post-World War II decisions seem to suggest that blasphemy laws might not be constitutional. So you have a 1952 Supreme Court case. It's called Joseph Burston, Inc. Uh, and it asserts, without really any argument, historical or otherwise, that, quote, it's not the business of government in our nation to suppress real or imagined attacks on any particular religious doctrine, unquote. And more recent decisions by the US Supreme Court, including decisions authored by Justice Scalia himself, could make it difficult as well to enforce a blasphemy law. So you have a 1992 case called RAV, for example. And in this case, Justice Scalia expanded the reach of a doctrine called viewpoint neutrality. Viewpoint ne neutrality is the First Amendment rule which says that when the government regulates private speech, it can't discriminate against speech on the basis of its message. It can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint. And uh, Justice Scalia famously, or maybe, according to some, infamously, joined in the 1989 Johnson decision, which held that flag burning counted as constitutionally protected free speech. Uh, now, Justice Scalia is justly renowned for the rich historical arguments he makes in other decisions, but in neither of those two cases uh, was there much in the way of any historical argument. Now, because of decisions like these, uh, most people who know even a little bit about constitutional law assume that the First Amendment prohibits the government from punishing blasphemy. If, the, if a state tried to enforce an anti-blasphemy law, uh, they'd say, oh, you're violating free speech. You're violating free religious exercise. You're violating non-establishment by doing so. And many people even just assume that this is obviously true as a historical matter. Maybe without looking into it, they assume that when the First Amendment was ratified, uh, it was obviously meant to prevent the government from enacting or enforcing anti-blasphemy laws. Uh, I argue something quite different, uh, historically speaking. I argue that originally, as originally understood, the First Amendment didn't prevent the government from punishing blasphemy. So to start out with, let's just define some terms. Let's first clarify what blasphemy means, because some people use the term imprecisely. Legally speaking, and I'd say this legal definition largely tracks theological definitions, blasphemy meant maliciously reviling God or the Christian religion, profanely ridiculing any of the three divine persons in the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that counted as blasphemy in the eyes of the law. Um, but it's important to note that the law distinguished between the crime of blasphemy on the one hand and religious heresy or apostasy on the other. Uh, if you deny divinely revealed truth, uh, no matter how respectfully you word it, that can count as heresy in the eyes of the church. And somebody who entirely abandons Christianity, no matter how sincere that person is in his newfound beliefs or how polite he is to his former co-religionists, that person would count as an apostate for abandoning Christianity. Um, but uh, just because, say, in the eyes of the church, you would be a heretic or an apostate, that doesn't mean you'd be a blasphemer in the eyes of the law. Now, this inquiry is a little bit complicated with the First Amendment, because you could say that the Bill of Rights, which includes the First Amendment, you could say it was ratified twice. The First Amendment reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of religion or abridging the freedom of speech of the press. This was first ratified in 1791, uh, but when it was first ratified, it was only thought to apply to the federal government, the US government. But you could say that this amendment was ratified again in 1868, because in 1868, the 14th Amendment, one of the post-Civil War amendments, applied the First Amendment to the states. 
Now, it's not clear whether we should treat 1791 or 1868 as the decisive year. Maybe you say we go with 1791 when it's the federal law that we're dealing with, and maybe it's 1868 when we're dealing with state law. That seems to be the view of Justice Thomas. Um, but because there's a little bit of ambiguity here, we're going to look at the period surrounding both of those years to figure out what the First Amendment originally mean, what free speech, what free exercise, and what no religious establishments originally required. Um, now, of course, this could, at least in theory, lead to two different answers. I mean, hypothetically, something that didn't count as within the compass of protected free speech in 1791 could have, through a process of, say, legal development or change, come to count as free speech by 1868, and that would complicate the analysis. Um, fortunately, in this case, uh, uh, no matter which date you look at, the answer seems to be the same. Um, so you might ask, how do we know what a constitutional provision meant in 1791? One tried and true method is to look at analogous state constitutional provisions and figure out what they meant in the lead up to and aftermath of 1791, the ratification of the Bill of Rights. This was actually the pro approach Justice Scalia himself took, uh, writing for the majority in a famous case uh, called Heller, which established the individual right uh, to bear arms under the Second Amendment. And what's actually notable about that case is that the dissent came to a totally opposite conclusion. Uh, that was Justice Breyer writing for the dissent, but actually used the same method. Both Justice Scalia writing for the court and Justice Breyer writing for the dissent looked at analogous state constitutional provisions for a right to bear arms to figure, and looked at state laws passed under those provisions to figure out what um, uh, the, the Second Amendment meant in 1791. So, in this approach, you know, it's not just that we can say cite the authority of the court that this is how they do it, or that you know other respected originalists do it this way. It's an approach that makes a lot of sense because most states have close, even verbatim, analogs to different provisions in the Bill of Rights, um, and it's also important that states started ratifying their constitutions right away in 1776. So you have quite a bit of data between Independence and 1791 when the Bill of Rights is passed, so that otherwise you wouldn't have anything to work, because you don't get the Federal Constitution's Bill of Rights until 1791. Also, even in the aftermath of 1791, you have a lot of state, active state legislation. The states are doing a lot, they're regulating and, and legislating on a lot of areas, but the federal government is just getting going. So if you want to know, um, you know what these provisions mean, there's just a lot more data if you look to the states than if you look to the very nascent startup y federal government at that point. So let's start with speech. Let's figure out what speech meant in 1791. In 1791, uh, there were two states, Vermont and Pennsylvania, that explicitly protected the words, quote unquote, freedom of speech in their state constitutions. This isn't to say that other states didn't think that speech was important or might not have had implicit constitutional protections, but if you just look at the actual text, these are the two states that in 1791 say we protect, quote unquote, freedom of speech. You have the Vermont Constitution, which says, quote, the people have a right to freedom of speech, unquote. And you have the Pennsylvania Constitution that says, quote, every citizen may freely speak, write, and print on any subject, unquote. Uh, both of these states uh, had prescriptions uh, on blasphemy in the 1790s. So in 1797, the Vermont legislature made it a crime, quote, to contumeliously reproach God's providence and government, unquote. Uh, and in 1799, we know from a newspaper report that a Pennsylvania jury convicted uh, a blasphemer. So the newspaper report says, in this town on the 11th, a tobacconist and a fiddler was convicted on an indictment of blasphemy, blasphemy in all caps, as these uh, 18th century newspapers love to do. Um, and it's also worth noting that the fact that you had a jury convict, that's legally salient. Not only, so of course that means you had a prosecutor bring the charges. Uh, it means that a judge instructed the jury uh, that this was a crime. And the jury themselves convicted. Today we think that juries are just judges of the facts. They just say what happened. They don't judge the law. There was just a different understanding. If you just read the cases from this period, it was understood that judges, that juries, as much as judges, uh, judge the law, unlike today. So that's just a difference. So, I mean, you, I, I guess we would credit a jury conviction more than in terms of determining legal understandings than we would now. Um, so, 
Moving from freedom of speech, let's look at freedom of the press. Quite a few states protected freedom of the press. Uh, I'm just going to give a couple of salient examples. So the New Hampshire Constitution said, quote, in 1791, the liberty of the press is essential to the security of freedom in a state. It ought, therefore, to be inviolably preserved. Uh, and in 1791, under this constitutional provision, and in the same year that New Hampshire, that the country was ratifying the First Amendment, uh, the New Hampshire legislature passed a law that made it a crime, quote, to willfully blaspheme the name of God, Jesus Christ, or the Holy Ghost, unquote. I think that's pretty good evidence. It's literally 1791, the year the First Amendment was ratified, and it's safe that explicitly protects freedom of the press. Uh, it's likewise in Massachusetts, their constitution said, quote, the liberty of the press is essential to the security of freedom in a state. It, not, ought, not, it ought not therefore to be restrained in this commonwealth, unquote. And in 1782, just two years after passing this constitutional provision, Massachusetts passed a statute, I think it's actually still in force, last I checked, or I mean, I shouldn't say it's, it's still on the books, uh, that says, quote, if any person shall willfully blaspheme the holy name of God, he shall be punished. Um, free exercise wasn't any different. So uh, almost all states had free exercise provisions of some sort in their constitution. Uh, New Jersey had one, um, uh, you know, that said, uh, no person shall ever be deprived of the privilege of worshiping God in a manner agreeable to his own conscience. You can't be compelled to attend a place of worship contrary to your own faith and judgment. Um, and in 1796, they passed a uh, uh, standard anti-blasphemy law. It's uh, a crime willfully to blaspheme the holy name of God by cursing or contemplatively reproaching Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost or the Christian religion. Same thing with Delaware. Delaware said... No power shall be vested in any magistrate that shall in any case interfere with or in any manner control the rights of conscience in the free exercise of religious worship. In 1797, you have a compilation of uh, actively and active uh, current uh, state statutes in Delaware, uh, and it includes the colonial blasphemy law. And it's worth making an aside here that um, to prevent a legal advance or a legal void, um, right after these states um, achieved independence, they immediately, the state legislatures, they all did two things. Number one, they all passed a new constitution setting up the new Republican form of government. And number two, they passed a statute saying that all of our old law, the English common law, the statutory law of the colony, all of that is still good law to the degree that it's compatible with our new Republican constitutions. So even if a state didn't say, pass an explicit blasphemy statute, or right off the bat in the 1790s, it was understood as a general matter that the old anti-blasphemy law still applied. And the evidence of this is again, you have these statutory compilations, here are the laws of Delaware. And they include colonial anti-blasphemy laws, even though Delaware had all of the constitutional provisions that we have you know, in the First Amendment. What's interesting actually about this Delaware statutory compilation is that it was authored by none other than President John Adams and Massachusetts Governor uh, Samuel Adams' cousins, uh, who I guess were moonlighting as legal publishers, and decided that they would publish this compilation of Delaware statutes at the direction of the Delaware legislature and with the approval of the Delaware authorities. Um, so right now we have a lot of data on the table that says, look, these states protected First Amendment rights, yet they punished blasphemy. But what we don't have is any explanation of why those two things were compatible, why that was okay. We don't have much reasoning. But fast forward to 1810, and we get the first blasphemy case. And that's in uh, 1810, we're in New York, or in upstate New York, in fact. Um, and you have a guy named Ruggles. His case is pretty famous. It's probably the best known blasphemy case. A guy named Ruggles is prosecuted for blasphemy in upstate New York. Um, and Ruggles had used profanity to insult our Lord. He def uh, Ruggles defamed our Lord as illegitimate and called his uh, blessed mother a correspondingly obscene epithet, which I will not quote. Um, Ruggles was tried and convicted by a jury, uh, and then he appealed his conviction to the state Supreme Court. For the lawyers in the room, uh, this is the uh, Pearson versus Post Court. So at this time, the state court of the Supreme Court of New York was a high appellate court. Um, uh, today, it's they've they've reshuffled around their court systems. So that's not true today, but it was true as of this time. Uh, and so Ruggles' lawyer says, hey, look, there's a free exercise provision in our state constitution. The state constitution literally says, the free exercise 
of religious profession and worship without any discrimination of preference shall hereafter be allowed within the state to all mankind. Pretty clearly free exercise in the Constitution. Yet nonetheless, the court, uh, this appellate court in New York, uh, upheld the conviction. And it's notable the decision by the court was unanimous. All the, uh, the, ju the judges uh, on the court agreed. And um, the opinion of the court was written by uh, Chief Justice James Kent, who's a pretty famous lawyer known for his a uh, pretty famous jurist known for his four-volume commentary on American law, and kind of a big name, uh, at least in legal circles. Um, and his opinion said, look, of course we have free religious exercise in New York, uh, but this doesn't infringe on free religious exercise. We can draw a line between speech that's protected by freedom of religion, uh, protected religious speech, and blasphemy, which is punishable. And he said the line that we're going to draw is, quote, collected from the offensive levity, scurrilous or opprobrious language in other circumstances, whether the act of the party was malicious. So if you spoke respectfully and respectfully explained, Here's, here are my religious views, here's why I think them, that was within the purview of free religious exercise. But if you maliciously uh, used scurrilous and opprobrious language, that would not be protected. So that was a free exercise case, and that was the main claim. Fast forward to Pennsylvania, it's 1826. We have a case called Updegraff. And you have the defendant, the guy's name is Updegraff. He's convicted uh, of blasphemy for a speech he delivered at a Pittsburgh debate society. So all of the debate society members in this room better watch out, be careful what you say <laughs> on the debate floor. Um, and what's interesting is that Updegraff, he makes a free speech argument, but he doesn't only argue with under the Pennsylvania Constitution. Now, we saw the Pennsylvania Constitution did protect free speech. He actually also interestingly makes an argument under the US Constitution. And you might be surprised by that because we just said the Bill of Rights only originally applied to the federal government. That's, I guess, true for the most part, but it wasn't firmly established as a legal matter until 1833. In 1833, the Supreme Court ruled definitively the Bill of Rights only applies against the federal government, not against the states. Up until 1833, and I remember where in 1826, it was at least an open question. There was a colorable legal argument that the Bill of Rights limited the states. And so the lawyer is throwing everything he's got at the court. Uh, and he throws a free speech claim at the court under both the state constitution and the federal constitution. And it's notable that the, the high court of Pennsylvania, it doesn't say, uh, oh, no, the, the federal constitution doesn't apply. Instead, it just says free speech, whether we're talking about the US constitution or the state constitution, free speech is irrelevant here. Um, the, the court holds that, quote, uh, the free speech clause of either constitution did not make the colonial blasphemy statute, quote, obsolete or virtually repealed. It was all good law. And in its analysis, the court turned to uh, US Supreme Court Justice uh, James Wilson, who was a founding father who was present at the 1787 Philadelphia Constitution. And he had been hired by the state of Pennsylvania, by the le state legislature, when they ratified a new constitution to revise all the state law, to throw out anything that was incompatible with the Constitution, the new state constitution, and keep only what's good under the new state constitution. So th they turned to him, founding father, president at the US Constitutional Convention, uh, helped re rewrite all the state laws. Uh, and he also was a famous lawyer. I mean, I guess as you'd expect, he was, a, he was a Supreme Court justice. And he had written an important work called The Lectures of Law. And in the lectures of law, um, Chief Justice, or sorry, Justice, U.S. Justice, Supreme Court Justice uh, Wilson says, "Oh yeah, of course, um, we we punish blasphemy under the law." And he didn't seem to think there was any problem either under the U.S. Constitution or under the state constitution, uh, both of which he was intimately familiar with. Um, and again, we see this legal rule. We saw the legal rule first in the context of free exercise, but now this legal rule comes into the speech context, which is that. Opinions that are seriously, temperately, and argumentatively expressed, those, those are protected speech. Um, but, quote, despite full railings, those are not. And under this legal test for what counts as blasphemy, it's, quote, only the malicious reviler of Christianity who is punished, uh, unquote. So we've seen some data from the founding. We've seen the reasoning fleshed out in the early 19th century, but what about 1868? We might ask, does this understanding hold in 1868? Because if not, that would be a problem, since uh, at least 
uh, as it applies to the states, the First, Chief, the First Amendment only uh, you know, comes through the 14th Amendment. So what's interesting is that in 1868, you have uh, an important legal scholar named Thomas Cooley. Uh, he writes a book called A Treatise on Constitutional Limitations. Uh, and this book has been described, at least by some legal historians, as the most important uh, legal constitutional law treatise in the latter half of the 19th century. So it's, it's a pretty significant work. And he covers you know, everything that you would think about. But he has a whole section uh, on free relig uh, religious liberty that also delves into speech. And what he says in this sort of standard legal treatise, that if you just wanted to know US constitutional law, you pick it up off the shelf and flip. He, he cites all the cases we've looked at so far, and he says the, this is the standard doctrine, this is the standard rule, the rule that's formulated in Ruggles, that's formulated in Uptograph, and then he says, quote, blasphemy is punishable as a crime, but one is still at liberty to dispute and argue against the truth of the Christian religion. To forbid discussion on this subject would be to abridge liberty of speech and of the press. Blasphemy implies something more than denial of the truths of any religion. A bad motive must exist. There must be a willful and malicious attempt to lessen men's reverence for the deity or for the accepted religion. So we see now this rule laid out in the earlier cases. There are a couple of other cases I omitted just for the interest of time that say basically the same thing from other state high courts, Massachusetts, Delaware. Um, this is just the standard black letter law that makes its way into the legal treatises that working lawyers, if they want to know what the law is, they just pull it off the shelf. But then you might ask, OK. This was a matter, this was true as a matter of accepted legal doctrine as of 1868. Indeed, again, this book was published in 1868, right when the Fourth Amendment was ratified. What about practice on the ground? Were people still ever being tried or convicted for blasphemy, or had this sort of fallen into desuetude? Uh, and the answer is, yeah, we have pretty good evidence that um, people were tried and convicted of blasphemy. We have a really famous trial from 1887 uh, in New Jersey. You have this former Methodist minister, who's now an ex-minister, very, very, uh, very hostile to religion, hates the whole thing. Realizes he thinks he's, I guess, he thinks he's been bamboozled by the whole religion thing, uh, and he goes around um, delivering sort of incendiary speeches and then handing out incendiary tracts uh, against uh, God and against religion, and. Uh, he's tried under this uh, blasphemy statute that New Jersey has actually just recently reenacted. Uh, and yeah, a jury convicts him. Now, as we know, what, what happens when you get tried for blasphemy? Maybe you'll try to throw out a free speech argument, see if it sticks. Uh, it hasn't stuck so far, and that pattern's going to hold here as well. So at trial, you have a defense attorney who's this sort of famous uh, atheist, sort of polemicist, kind of like a uh, Christopher Hitchens kind of guy goes and defends him at trial. And at the trial, the defense uh, uh, quotes, quote, the great clause in the Constitution, state constitution of 1844, more important than any other clause in that, instru in, in that instrument, a clause that shines like a star in the night. No law shall ever be passed to restrain or abridge the liberty of speech or of the press. So he makes this very vigorous free speech argument that you can't convict this guy for blasphemy. New Jersey also had in the other analogous First Amendment provisions, so religious liberty uh, and non-establishment. He throws everything at the judge, and the judge just very straightforwardly says, you're wrong about the law. Um, you know, we know that this law was recently reenacted. We know it's good law. Blasphemy is a crime. And blasphemy is, by the way, different from heresy. It would be a problem if this were a heresy law, but this isn't a heresy law. It's a blasphemy law. Um, and within an hour, the jury convicts. Now, this case was a big deal. This wasn't happening in some sort of backwards, backwater place with no connection to the broader picture of what's going on in American life. This was in a um, Morristown, New Jersey, which some of you who know the New Jersey area, it's quite close to New York. Today it's a suburb of New York. The New York Times was there at the trial reporting on it every day, so we have extensive press reports from one of those prominent newspapers in the country. And the New York Times didn't just report on this case, it actually editorialized on it as well. Uh, and given the sort of 
uh, editorial stance of the New York Times today, you might be surprised to you know the New York Times was very much in favor of prosecuting blasphemy, at least back then, thought it was constitutional, at least. So the New York Times says, we can't agree with the defense that the law is iniquitous because obscene literature and blasphemous literature stand on the same footing. So the idea is that, yeah, blasphemy is just like obscenity. The government can punish it, no problem there, as of 1887. Um, and so I just want to quickly get run through non-establishment. Uh, we've seen a lot of states, a lot of cases. Uh, what we saw with free speech and free exercise, that also helped with non-establishment. So it's a little bit trickier. A lot of states had free speech. A lot of states had free exercise right at the start. But as some of you may know, a lot of states actually preserved their religious establishments in some form for at least a little while. So you have Congregationalist establishments here in New England. You had Anglican establishments in the South. Um, so you really actually have to look at the mid-Atlantic states, because following sort of their William Penn heritage, a lot of these mid-Atlantic states never had religious establishments, not even in the colonial period. And then in their initial constitutions, they passed very strict constitutional prohibitions on establishments. So just to quote uh, some mid-Atlantic provisions, you have Pennsylvania says, no preference shall ever be given by law to any religious establishments or modes of worship. That's the Pennsylvania Constitution. You have the Delaware Constitution. Nor shall a preference be given by law to any religious societies, denominations, or modes of worship. And you have the New Jersey Constitution, which says there shall be no establishment of any one religious sect in this preference uh, to another. And as we've seen, Pennsylvania uh, and New Jersey both prosecuted blasphemy. Uh, in the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, the same is true of Delaware. One of the really important blasphemy appellate cases comes from Delaware. Um, and uh, what's interesting is we saw there's a very clear justification for the, for the um, speech and free exercise clauses. And that justification was you can say whatever religious opinions you have as long as you say them respectfully. Uh, but as soon as you veer into malicious reviling, it's a crime. We have a slightly different, we actually don't have one clear justification for why uh, prosecuting blasphemy was compatible with the rule against religious establishments. Um, we have two different rationales that I've seen in the cases. One is the Pennsylvania rationale, and the Pennsylvania rationale is that um, religious establishment bans a preference for any particular church or sect. So if we said, we have the Church of England as the established religion of Pennsylvania, that would be a no-go under their ban on religious establishments, but that doesn't prevent recognition of quote unquote general Christianity. General Christianity, you can promote that and that doesn't create a conflict with the rule against religious establishments. Delaware has a different rationale. Uh, and Delaware says that you can't pass a law saying that this state uh, is you know, one religion or another, but what courts can do is just like courts take note of the calendar, you know, we don't have to have a law saying that we're going to follow the Gregorian calendar. We just follow it. Courts can also take note sociologically of the fact that most people in this state are Christian. They can even take note of the fact that, hey, we, we take our oaths on the Bible. It's the form of oaths. The state was founded by, you know, Christian Swedes. Uh, it's been Christian throughout its history. And to prevent offense against the people of Delaware who have adopted Christianity as their religion, we can punish uh, anti-Christian blasphemy, but of course the court went on. Uh, the people of Delaware are free to change their uh, religious beliefs, uh, you know, whenever they want. So, um, in conclusion, Justice Scalia used to like to say, "Quote: The judge who always likes the results he reaches is a bad judge." That was part of his originalist philosophy: is that we should follow the evidence. Uh, wherever it leads. Uh, and it's not clear that Scalia would have been uh, uncomfortable, given his normative views, which we know from his law school days, it's not clear that he would have been uh, you know, against a constitutional rule that said prosecuting blasphemy is constitutional. We don't really know one way or the other. Uh, what I know pretty certain, though, is that most contemporary originalists would be uncomfortable with a constitutional rule that said you could prosecute blasphemy. Um, so far, originalists have ignored this history. And maybe, I don't know, but maybe it's due to discomfort about where following the history might lead. Um, I simply argue my normative takeaway is that originalists need to uh, take on the evidence head on. 
They should either adopt the original meaning on blasphemy, or they should just explain why they're not doing so. But I don't think ignoring the evidence uh, is the right thing to do, analytically speaking. Uh, you know, and they could even fight back against the historical reading. So I've argued, I've offered a reading of historical evidence, and you know, I think somebody could potentially try and read the evidence differently. I think that there'd be serious evidentiary problems with that reading. And I don't think it would ultimately be successful, but you could try to uh, fight back against the evidence I've presented. Um, but for champions of a historically informed reading of the Constitution, simply ignoring history shouldn't be an option. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.